Well, today we sort of observe uh, St. Francis and his feast, which actually occurred on Wednesday. Uh, but we will bless animals tonight, and we'll have some special guests in a few minutes to bless. Uh, and we all know, I think it's well known, that St. Francis is admired around the world as the saint who loved animals. So much so that one writer dubbed this popularity of Francis as the birdbath industrial complex. His love for animals is not the wrong reason to love Francis. In fact, now more than ever, we need his example of reverence and communion with the earth and all of its creatures. But even a slightly deeper look into the life and teachings of Francis beyond his garden statue image presents us with someone who embraced an extraordinary imitation of Jesus' life and teachings. Francis' love for the animals grew out of an all-encompassing radical spirituality. Francis learned how to love from God. He was the rich kid whose carefree life eventually disillusioned him. He was born in the 12th century, and he awakened to the harsh reality of the suffering around him. Every time he passed a crucifix hanging over a wayside shrine or a church altar, he saw Jesus suffering on the cross as the worst of humankind's cruelty. And his acute sensitivity to the natural beauty of the Italian countryside made his new awareness all the more palpable. When he emerged from his spiritual crisis, Francis threw off his bespoke suit, put on the face of Christ, and clothed himself with the gospel. Like the God we've been meeting in Matthew all these Sundays in our scriptures, Francis became indiscriminate and extravagant in his love for everyone and everything. He appeared foolish to those who didn't understand, and he still does. By patterning his life so literally after Jesus, Francis represented what it looks like to become a whole person at once fully connected to God and fully rooted to this earth. He recognized no separation between matter and spirit. He not only loved every creature, he wove a true kinship with them and with all of creation. We all know the way he spoke. Brother sun, sister moon, mother earth, brother wolf, friend the sparrow. The whole nature, the whole of nature was his family and they shared the same maker. This is the way Francis spoke and related to the world. France has, Francis has much to teach us about stewardship and partnership in our care for the Earth's vineyard. In the order of creation, there are ultimately only two categories, God and creatures. When we forget which one we are, that's when things go wrong for us and for the world. In the parable we hear today from Matthew, the owner has some vicious tenants managing his vineyard. Repeatedly, they plot to take it as their own, and they wreak havoc with the owner's property. They even fend off and kill the master's messengers one by one, including the master's very own son, all in the name of taking possession of the land. St. Francis would have been the ideal tenant in Jesus' parable of this vineyard, because he understood that the vineyard did not belong to him. He understood that the earth and all that is in it is the Lord's. So tenants and stewards, by definition, are those who are entrusted with things they do not own. As the tenants of the vineyard, or rather stewards of the earth, we are charged with caring for everything that is and everything that belongs to God. In the beginning, when God creates vegetation and all the creatures of sea and land and sky, God blesses each of them to become fruitful and multiply. When humans are created, the blessing God gives us is to be stewards of creation who till and keep the earth. The story says nothing about our blessing taking precedence over the prior blessings given to all the rest of creation, all of which God here first. Our creator entrusts us with one job, which is to safeguard the flourishing of the entire earth. What kind of tenants are we? How are we caring for the vineyard that we are charged to care for and do not own? 
How are we ensuring that every creature has what it needs to flourish and be fruitful and multiply? As tenants to whom God has entrusted the vineyard, what kind of stewards have we been towards the air, the land, the seas, the forests, the living creatures, even the ones we eat? The answers to these questions are evident in every report of species extinction, tree disease, soil depletion, water and food supply disaster, to name just a few of the myriad alarm bells ringing for our attention. The answer is evident the world over, everywhere there is war, most especially right now in Israel and also in Ukraine, where people are killing each other and desecrating the earth all in the name of possessing the land. Like tenants in the parable, we've forgotten that the earth and all its creatures do not belong to us. As a species and as a society, we've acted as though everything is our own to possess, to consume, and to profit from however we want. We fend off every warning, kill every messenger. But suppose we could redirect our extravagance the way Francis redirected his, the way that he channeled his fierce living and love for the things of the world into a fierce love for God's creation. Now we can begin to imagine the vineyard as God imagined it. Francis chose to live simply so that others may simply live, to quote from a 1970s poster that hung in my childhood Episcopal church. Francis both turned his heart to heaven and embraced the earth. He saw no separation between the two. In rabbinical study, rabbinical study of Hebrew scriptures, sometimes special attention is given to the first and last items in a sequence of texts or a list of commands. For example, Psalm 150 relates back to Psalm 1. And today, we have the Ten Commandments. The first one says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods. And the last command is the injunction, you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. All the commandments in between amount to variations on violating the first and last ones. When Jesus summarizes the law in the New Testament as the commands to love God and love your neighbor as yourself, all the other eight are subsumed into those two. Francis perceived the simplicity of these two commandments and his life exemplified the way in which all life flows from holding those two commands together. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. For Francis, his neighbor was every created being, both animate and inanimate. When we choose to li live simply like Jesus did and like Francis did, it brings us to the most radical freedom the more simply we live, the more free we become from the power of others to buy us off or control us with money or status or reward or loss or gain of any kind. When we choose to live simply, we don't have much to protect or any need to acquire more and no need for moral or material superiority over others. To live simply frees us to exercise nonviolence not only in our deeds, but also in our words and in our thoughts. When we choose to live simply, we no longer can see refugees and immigrants or anyone else on the margins of society as a threat, and we begin to see ourselves in solidarity with them instead, as fellow pilgrims and travelers on this hard road of life. And perhaps most challenging of all to the choice of a simple life, time. When we choose to live simply, Time is no longer money. Finally, we have time for eternal things, for prayer and contemplation and service to others, time for one another, time to carry out the work of justice, and time to cultivate and restore the earth wherever we happen to live. But simple is different than easy. In fact, the simple life is the opposite of the easy life. We spend most of our lives acquiring this is something Richard Rohr talks about a lot, and our book group is studying his book at this moment. We spend most of our lives acquiring, whether it's our possessions or attitudes or reputations. 
and we think our goal is to get to easy street. But the simple life is letting go continually of all these acquisitions, and letting go is anything but easy. Yet such simplicity is the joyful and beautiful path to the essential life where God is at the center and where everyone has a place in the vineyard of the Lord and all live as neighbors and fellow creatures, living out our blessing of being stewards, not owners, in order that all lives may have a chance to be fruitful and to flourish. <laughs>